Thank you so much. Hey, can we keep our hands going for our Zion Online family? Come on, we can do better than that. We love you. You're awesome. And thank you for joining us. And uh, we'd love to connect with you wherever you're streaming from, whenever you watch this. If there's anything going on in your life where people have prayer, and we believe that prayer is power. And we love uh, praying for you and helping you take your next steps in your spiritual journey. So thank you so much for joining us. It's so good to be with you guys. And man, I, I, I told Joey after that worship set, I'm like, I don't know if I have anything left in me after worshiping like that. Uh, but can we put our hands together and honor our friend and guest worship leader, en Eniola? Eniola. I had it the first service, and I thought, thought about it too much the second service. Come on. That anointing, you just blessed us so much. And um, I am, I'm undone. I've dreamed about being a part of a church like this. You know, like before Zion existed, I dreamed about being a part of a church like this. Not, it wasn't about leading a church like this. It was about being a part of a church like this in South Orange County. And to be worshiping with you all and to feel the Holy Spirit of God move so powerfully and evidently upon the passionate praises of, of his people, there is no place I would rather be. Amen? And uh, man, I just want to thank you. I want to thank you for leaning in. And uh, if you've got anything left in the tank, we're going to jump into the last message in our 12-week collection of messages in the Gospel of Luke. If you're taking notes, if you'd like to take notes, the title of my message this morning is, He's Made It Clear. He's Made It Clear. At the beginning of Luke's Gospel, he tells us his purpose and his intent. He said, many people have set out to write accounts about the events that have been fulfilled among us. They use the eyewitness report circulating among us from the early disciples, having carefully investigated everything from the beginning. I also have decided to write an accurate account for you so you can be certain, everyone say certain, of the truth of everything you were taught. Luke's purpose from beginning to end in his gospel is to make it clear, to make it clear who Jesus was, who Jesus is, and who Jesus will always be. In fact, he says, I want to make it so clear for you because Luke's profession was a doctor, so he was trained in things like specificity and accuracy, and he cared about the details, and so his gospel is unique in the way, I mean, all of them were truthful and inerrant and specific, but his was unique in a way where he began in Luke chapter 1 by saying, I'm giving you a detailed, careful exploration of Jesus's life teachings ministry, death, and resurrection. And then at the end, in Luke chapter 24, where we're going to jump into today, he provides us a narrative. He gives us a story of how Jesus makes it clear to his disciples yet again. He wants to give us clarity because when we're clear, it builds confidence. And in Luke chapter 24... We enter the story where Jesus, three days before, had hung on a cross and died for the sins of humanity. And all of his disciples scattered, and his disciples were filled with hopelessness and doubt and confusion. But they did not know on this third day that something was happening behind the scenes. That God was working when it was at their darkest hour. But in the midst of their fear and confusion and the unknown about the future, Luke chapter 24 records a story of two of Jesus' disciples walking down the road to Emmaus, discussing the things that had just taken place. And as they walked and they talked together, the risen Jesus began walking beside them. Can you imagine that? 
They hadn't yet had an appearance of Jesus. They, they, they didn't believe that he was risen. But in that moment, Jesus, you know, Scripture says that somehow Jesus disguised himself. Like he hid himself from their knowledge of his appearance. Uh, likely supernaturally, theologians would say. So they didn't know that it was Jesus walking with them. But Jesus just strolls up to these guys and he goes, hey guys, what you talking about? And they go, haven't you heard? All of the events that transpired in Jerusalem three days ago, there was this man named Jesus and we had hoped that he was like the guy. We had hoped that he was going to be our Messiah. He, we had hoped that he was going to be the one that would rescue us and save Israel. And yet our religious leaders weren't huge fans of him. And so they killed him. And he's going, wow, this is crazy. Haven't you heard that, that, that all of this happened? And he said, tell me more, tell me more. And they said, well, here's the craziest thing about it. This morning, uh, women that were following him, people that we knew, they went to go embalm this, this, this dead savior. Um, and then they said that the stone to the tomb was rolled away and they saw angels and the angels said that he wasn't here, he was risen, but that's crazy, right? And he's like, I don't know. And in that moment, we picture Jesus walking and talking with these guys. And at this point, as Jesus is walking with him, he can't contain himself. And so he responds to one of the disciples. Uh, uh, it wasn't one of the 12 disciples. His name was Cleopas. And at this point, Jesus can't contain himself. And he's like, Cleopas, Cleopas, Cleopas. What an unfortunate name you have right? He says in Luke 24, 25, you find it so hard to believe all that the prophets wrote in the scriptures, but wasn't it clearly predicted that the Messiah would have to suffer all these things before entering his glory? And then Jesus took them through the writings of Moses and all the prophets explaining from all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Wasn't it clearly predicted? He's made it clear. In this moment, Jesus takes them back to the law and to the prophets and to the Old Testament and begins to explain to them why they should have a trust that's based on truth. He wants to show them how scriptures point the way like a map. Anyone remember um, life before GPS? Anyone over 35 in the room? <laughs> Anyone remember the fold-out map on a road trip where you had to do like mathematics, like, like schematics, and you had to figure out how far you would be able to go on one tank of gas, and you were like in the middle of Iowa, and you were hoping that you wouldn't run out of gas, and you were looking on the freeway for that exit sign that had a picture of one of the gas stations, and you were, anyone, no, no one's over 35 in this room. It was confusing. But then we got a little clearer. Things got a little bit more directionally savvy. When the internet came out, there then was this thing called MapQuest. Yeah, give it up for MapQuest. We got some MapQuest. Now, now I know my demographic in the room, all right? We're, we're born right around there. Um, you remember printing out page by page, turn by turn? Did anyone, like, like you know you were like, like a diehard MapQuest fan if you had like a three-hole punch and you put it in a binder? in your car, <laughs> you're like 10.7 mile, okay. Like, how is it now that texting and driving is illegal but MapQuest was okay? <laughs> like, you literally have a binder. You're doing homework in the car as you're driving. <laughs> but thank God for GPS on our phones. Turn by turn directions. You don't have to get in your car and wonder where anything is. You just type in the name of that restaurant and you're gonna get an immediate 
GPS, turn by turn, this is what it's gonna look like to get there. Here's the traffic situation. Here's your arrival time. And you can, if you want, you can have a female with a British voice tell you exactly how to get there turn by turn. In the Old Testament, there were these guys called prophets. And prophets heard from God and spoke future. And, and, and as they spoke God's future, God used it in his word as signs, as signals, as to what we should be looking for turn by turn when the Messiah came. They were a GPS for us of sorts to point the way to who the Messiah would be, what it would look like, and how things would be fulfilled. And the reality is, is that much of life is mysterious. It's tough to figure out sometimes. And frankly, even parts of the Bible are tough to understand without some cultural historical context. But there is one thing more than anything that God wants you to be crystal clear about. And it's this question, who is Jesus? There's no more important question in all of life. And your answer to this question is the foundation for everything. And so my goal for us this morning is to walk out of here with so much confidence in Jesus that he's exactly who God, through his divinely inspired scripture, said he would be. And he did for us exactly what God's prophets said he would do so that you and I, we can believe without a shadow of a doubt that Jesus is, in fact, the way, the truth, and the life. In the Old Testament, did you know that there were over 300 messianic prophecies, prophecies pointing to the Messiah, that were literally fulfilled in Jesus' birth, his life, his ministry, his death, and his resurrection. These prophecies, check this out, were written from a minimum of 500 years to 1,400 years before Jesus' birth. And in the conversation on the road, it says in Luke 24 that Jesus took them through the writings of the prophets explaining all these things concerning himself. And so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take us through this morning what I believe Jesus likely would have taken these two disciples through on the walk to Emmaus. Going back to the Old Testament, and here's what I want to do. We're going to look at these 10 prophecies and see if Jesus literally fulfilled them. Then I want to look at the odds of one man fulfilling all these prophecies. And finally, I want to suggest one point of application for us today. How clear am I being today? He's made it clear. The first messianic prophecy, are you ready? This is a great time to take notes, by the way. Was that Jesus or the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. The prophet Micah, over 700 years before Jesus was born, says this in Micah 5.2, But you, O Bethlehem, are only a small village among all the people of Judah, yet a ruler of Israel whose origins are in the distant past will come from you on my behalf. Over 700 years before Jesus was born, where? In Bethlehem. The second messianic prophecy was that he would be born of a virgin. The prophet Isaiah in Isaiah 7, 14, this is over 700 years before Jesus was born, said this, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Look, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. Fulfilled. The third prophecy is that he will perform miraculous signs and healings. The prophet Isaiah said in Isaiah 35, and when he comes, he will open the eyes of the blind 
and unplug the ears of the deaf. The lame will leap like a deer, and those who cannot speak will sing for joy. Springs will gush forth in the wilderness, and streams will water the wasteland. Who did Jesus show up and be? The healer. The fourth messianic prophecy is that he will ride into Jerusalem on a donkey. Over 500 years before Jesus came into the city of Jerusalem, Zechariah, the prophet, says in Zechariah 9.9, Rejoice, O people of Zion. Shout in triumph, O people of Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming to you. He's righteous and victorious, yet he is humble riding on a donkey riding on a donkey's colt, fulfilled. The fifth messianic prophecy is that he would be unjustly tried and condemned. Isaiah 53, verse 8 says, unjustly condemned, he was led away. No one cared that he died without descendants, that his life was cut short in midstream, literally fulfilled as Jesus was a single man, unmarried, without descendants, and he died at 33 and a half years old. Prophecy number six was that he would be whipped and then crucified with his hands and feet pierced. Look at how specific the prophecies are. This was over five to 700 years before Christ. Isaiah 53, verse five, he was whipped so we could be healed. Psalm twenty two sixteen. the psalmist says, they have pierced my hands and feet, pointing to how the Messiah would die. Zechariah, the prophet, in 12, 10, says, they will look on me, whom they have pierced, and mourn for him as an only son. They will grieve bitterly for him as for a firstborn son who has died. Prophecy number seven. His clothes will be divided by casting dice. Look at how specific this is. Psalm 22, 18. The psalmist writes, over a thousand years, over a thousand years before Jesus died on the cross, the psalmist writes, they divide my garments among themselves and throw dice for my clothing. And that literally happened as the Roman soldiers put a purple robe on Jesus, mocking him as some sort of a king. They stripped it off of him as he hung there and suffocated to death. And as that robe was on the ground, the Roman soldiers threw dice to gamble for his clothing. Prophecy number eight, he will die as a sin offering. Isaiah chapter 53 says, he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins, He was beaten so we could be made whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. All of us, like sheep, have strayed away. We have left God's path to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. And when he sees all that is accomplished by his anguish, he will be satisfied. And because of his experience, my righteous servant will make it possible for many to be counted righteous. For he will bear all their sins. Prophecy number nine, he will be raised from the dead. Psalm 16, verse 10, hundreds of years before the empty tomb, the psalmist looks forward to the Messiah and says, for you will not leave my soul among the dead or allow your Holy One to rot in the grave. In prophecy number 10, he will be an eternal king in the line of David. Isaiah the prophet says in chapter 9, verse 6, for a child is born to us, a son is given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders. And he will be called, what? Wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. His government and its peace will never end. He will rule with fairness and justice from the throne of his ancestor, David, for how long? All eternity. Anybody in here thankful that he made it clear? Can I get some praise for five seconds that God did not leave us in confusion? God did not leave us wondering. 
God did not leave us wandering. God loved us so much, he said, clear is kind. And I have given you for over four Uh, 1,400 years, a GPS system through the prophets, specifically who Jesus would be, where he would be born, what he would do in his ministry, how he would love us, how he would lay down his life for my sins and your sins and the sins past, present, and future, the fact that he would not rot in the grave but would rise again three days later, and the fact that he is the eternal one. All of it, literally. I know we love that word, that word in Orange County, literally. <laughs> but all of it, literally fulfilled in Jesus Christ. What are the chances? Yeah, you can give some more praise to God for that. <laughs> and you're going to give him more praise in a moment. Because check this out. What are the chances of this being fulfilled in one man. What are the chances of all of these different prophets writing in different regions of the world over the course of 1,400 years, all specifically talking about these things and it being literally fulfilled in one person? Permission to nerd out for two minutes. Okay, those were just 10 of over 300 specific prophecies pointing to Jesus being the Messiah. Uh, um, Peter Stoner, what a last name, just fun names today. Uh, Stoner was actually brilliant. He, he was the chairman of the Department of Mathematics and Astronomy at Pasadena City College. Talk about overcoming your name. Um, he looked at only, only eight specific prophecies about Jesus. And he came up with an extremely conservative probability For each one being fulfilled, then he considered the likelihood of Jesus fulfilling all eight, just eight, just eight of over 300 of these prophecies. And Stoner calculated the probability of one man fulfilling these eight messianic prophecies as being one in 10 to the 17th power, one with 17 zeros behind it. I had to look up what this number actually is. It's one in 100 quadrillion. Tell your neighbor quadrillion. You just learned something new. I didn't know that was a number. One in 100 quadrillion. In his book, Science Speaks, he described it like this. He said, let's try to visualize this chance of all of this coming together and it being literally fulfilled through one person. Let's suppose that we take 100 quadrillion silver dollars. I looked for a silver dollar at my house this morning. I could not find one. But I had some amazing team members that made me one this morning. So just imagine that this is a silver dollar. I know it's gold. Um, We're getting creative back here. We're we're in a performing arts theater, so thank God. Um, Take one 100 quadrillion of these, and here's what I want you to do. I want you to mark one with a red Sharpie. And if we put one 100 quadrillion silver dollars over the great state of Texas and use the land mass of Texas as a boundary, it would cover the entire ground of the state of Texas two feet deep with silver dollars. And what I want you to do is I want you to take this one silver dollar that you've marked with a red Sharpie, and I want you to throw it into the middle of the state of Texas, and I want you to mix it all up, and then I want you to blindfold someone, and I want you to tell that person who's blindfolded, you can walk as far as you want in any direction, but you only have one chance to reach down and to pick up the one silver dollar that has the marking on it. That is the same likelihood 
that you would have in having one person, Jesus Christ, literally fulfill just eight of these messianic prophecies. Stoner concluded, check this out. (laughs) I, I love using his last name. Isn't it great? It's brilliant. Anyone who rejects Jesus as the son of God is rejecting a fact proved perhaps more absolutely than any other fact in the world. Conclusion. There are some things in life that may never be clear. Why are socks always missing? (laughs) Ikea instructions. Why do mosquitoes exist? One day I'm going to ask God about that. But one thing that God has made crystal clear from the Old Testament to the New Testament, from the beginning of time to real time right now, is that Jesus Christ is who Scripture said he is. Jesus Christ is Savior. He's Lord. He's King. He's coming back. Everything that's been written about him has been literally fulfilled and will be fulfilled in him. Jesus Christ is exactly who we need. One thing that you do not have to be shaky about is who Jesus is. One thing you don't have to be confused about is how much he loves you. One thing that you don't have to kind of be skeptical about is the reality of his life, death, and resurrection and what that personally means for you. So no matter what you're going through today, I just want you to know, it's not, this whole thing is not blind faith. It's not like, just trust God. Just trust him. Like wishful thinking or an emotional deal. It's trust based on truth. I want to repeat that again. This is trust in the only true God that we've been singing about today. Based on factual, scientific, verifiable truth that's agreed upon as ways to observe how things are true in the universe. That's the reason why Jesus can say things like in John chapter 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. In a culture of confusion, you can live with clarity because Jesus is the new GPS. Jesus said, I did not come to abolish the law and the prophets. I came to fulfill them. Everything is summed up now in Jesus. Jesus is the way the truth, and the life. I want you to catch something here. Jesus did not say, I am a way, I am a truth, or I am a life. The is important. Because in a culture that says there are many paths to God, Jesus, he goes, no, there's actually one path. Um, I'm like in and out. I'm gonna keep it simple. I'm gonna keep it straightforward. I'm going to be clear because clear is kind. And I'm not going to be exclusive to be mean. I'm going to be exclusive to show you that no one else is coming for you. There is one path to the top of the mountain, and you can't get there on your own. That's why I came for you. I am the way. You don't have to wander. You don't have to leave confused. You don't have to rub crystals. You, 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 come on now. Like, come on. Like, you, you, you don't have to try all of these other things to try to find a way to peace, a way to hope, a way to joy, a way to victory. Jesus is the way. He's the way to eternal life. Jesus says, no one comes to the Father except through me. And I have prepared a place for you. So don't worry about where you're going after this life because I am making your bed. And I've got this awesome place that I've prepared for you, but you can only come through me. A lot of people get bogged down by the exclusivity of Jesus. He's too exclusive. I like it because he's simple. It's just facts. 
None of this was fulfilled through Buddha. None of this was fulfilled through Muhammad. None of the, none of like a tree. You know, like we see these reels of people like hugging and like rolling on trees. It's like a tree did not come and die for you. It's the one who hung on a tree, who was humiliated, who took on the sins of the world. I am the way. I'm the truth. In a world of post-modernity where we have totally divorced ourselves from the reality that there is absolute truth in the universe, Jesus says, man, you don't have to try to go after all these philosophies and try to figure out what's truth. I am the truth. If you want to know what truth is, it's wrapped up in love. It's wrapped up in a man who died for you. It's wrapped up in the risen one who's seated on a throne. You want to know the truth about the world? Are you scared about the future? You want to know the truth about what's going to happen in the economy? What the truth about like what we're going to do in our culture and our situation? Yes, we should fight for truth. But the truth is, is that there is a man, a risen king, who is seated on the throne, and he ain't going to slip off it. And he is seated because he is secure. And he is the truth. You want to experience life beyond measure? You want to experience the rich, abundant John 10, 10 life that he promised you where you don't have to go back to your old habits, your patterns, pain, mechanism, sorts of things. He says, I'm, I'm the life. I'm where you can run to when you're struggling. I'm, I'm the rock you can lean on when you're, when you're hopeless. When you're lonely, I'm your guy. See, if he fulfilled everything said about him, everything he said can be trusted. It's beautiful to think about that thought. If everything that was said about Jesus was literally fulfilled, then everything Jesus said can be trusted. So when Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, it's true. And it can be trusted. He can be trusted. When Jesus says in John 14, 1, don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. He said it because he knows there's going to be times when our hearts are troubled. He knows that there are going to be moments when we believe in Jesus, but we're troubled by this thing in our life. And he said, Trust in me. What's troubling you today? What's that thing in your life that's just so hard to trust God for? We all have that thing in our life. And maybe for you, it's, it's as basic as just trusting that he loves you that much that he came for you, that he died for you, that, that you can actually be forgiven and accepted, that he's real, that he hears your prayers. I want you to know all of that is real, and we can know that God is real. We can know that he hears our prayers because Scripture tells us that that's who God is, and he can be trusted. But maybe for others of us, in here, there's, there's like this difficulty in trusting other people. Maybe you've experienced people break your trust in life, and it's hard to trust people at their word. E even, even if people have broken your trust, I want you to know Jesus never will. You can trust Jesus, and he'll heal all those places of brokenness in your heart. Jesus is, is the one who said, um, I'm the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so some of you, you're wondering if he's going to be the same in your future, in your forever, as he was in your past. I was talking to someone after this first service that's going through a, um, a job transition. And it's hard right now to wrestle with the idea that God's been faithful in the past, but 
My future is unknown. And Jesus says, I've prepared a place for you. And the Bible says that you go from strength to strength. You go from glory to glory. You go from grace to grace. It doesn't mean that it's all like this. Sometimes it's like this, but you're still going upwards. And Jesus said, I will never leave you, and I will never forsake you. And I will work all things together. Paul says, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that God will work all things together of the good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. He can be trusted. Everything the Bible, in other words, everything the Bible says can be trusted because it's based on truth and not feelings. And everything Jesus said can be trusted because everything said about him has been literally fulfilled. So maybe you've been faced with a medical diagnosis. There's a doctor report that's come your way, and there's fear. And there's trouble that's come your way. Who is Jesus? He's your healer. Because prophetically, Isaiah said he's going to unplug the ears of the deaf. He's going to open the eyes of the blind. He, and all that Jesus did when he came on the scene is show up in love and compassion and mercy and action. And he said, I care not just about your eternal life, but your earthly life. And I still heal. I still am in the miracle working business. Why? Because Jesus is still the same yesterday, today, and forever. Whatever is trying to rob you of trusting in Jesus today, it's a lie. It's a lie that's masked in the form of fear. But today is the day where you root yourself in the truth of God's word, that Jesus loves you more than you could ever imagine and you can never change that, that Jesus fulfilled everything spoken about him and uh, he's exactly who we needed him to be as our savior, as our Lord, as our healer, as our, as our provider. He's exactly who we need him to be as our king, as the election comes and as things are happening all around us, he is exactly who we need to be as our king who is still on the throne and in control of the universe. And you can root yourself today in relationship because Jesus did not say, trust in religion, trust in church, like a church service, trust in a feeling. He said, trust in me what would it look like today to trust in Jesus would you pray with me all across this place maybe for you this morning you came in and there's like a fog there's like a heaviness over your life you've tried a bunch of other things to make you happy. You've tried other things to make you feel fulfilled and still feel empty, hollow. Maybe you feel lonely, disconnected. Maybe you're here and if you'd be honest with me for just a moment, you'd say, John, I am not sure that I have put my trust in Jesus Christ. I'm not sure that I've given him my whole life. I'm not sure that I'm saved, that I have a home in heaven, that I have an eternal purpose to live for here today. I wanna give you that invitation right now. In a moment, I'm gonna count to three. And when I say three, I want you to shoot up your hand as high as you can, eyes are closed. This is between you and the Lord, it's a faith move. And believers, just be praying all throughout the place. Why did I share all that I shared today? Because I just want you to know how desperately God loves you. I want you to know how clearly he made it through his son, his one and only son, Jesus Christ. 
He stopped at nothing so that he could have you as his own and be in relationship with you and change your life, give you a home in heaven, an eternal purpose to live for today. This is for you today. This invitation stands. Today is the day of salvation. No turning back, new beginnings. The scripture says the old can be gone and the new can come and you can receive his new life. You can have trust in him based on this truth here today and you can be saved now and forever. It's a real thing. It's a real decision that you're about to make. And so one, I want you to know that Jesus loves you more than you could ever imagine and he made it clear because no one else is coming for you, so he wants you to be with him today. Two, I want you to know that this is a real decision that you're making. This isn't just some um, churchy thing or, or an emotional thing that you're doing. This is a real spiritual decision that lasts for all of eternity. And Jesus wants to give you brand new life here today. So one, two, three, Shoot up your hand right now and just say, I give you my life. Jesus, I give you my life. Yeah, I see that hand. I see that hand. Keep it up because I want to pray for you. I see that hand. Jesus, I give you my life. Today is my day. No turning back. Yeah, today's the day where no door, no compartment is closed off to you, Jesus. Today is the day that I give you my life. Come on. I'm so glad that those hands went up. I want to pray for you right now. Jesus, bless these yeses. Bless their decisions. This is the day that you have made, and it is Resurrection Sunday. You have brought the dead back to life. Fill them with your resurrection life. Jesus, thank you for forgiving us from our sins. Thank you for your free gift of grace on the cross. Today we say yes to you. We trust you. We put our life in your hands. You gave your all for me. Today we give our all to you. In Jesus' name we declare we are saved and made brand new. And everyone said amen and amen. Put your hands together for all of those that crossed the line of faith today, come on. Hands went up. Those are real decisions. Would you stand with me? Would you stand with me? Hey, if you made a decision to follow Jesus, don't keep it to yourself. We're going to have our prayer team down here. We would love to celebrate with you and give you next steps in your spiritual journey. I also want to give an opportunity, a few things that our prayer team has been sensing. Um, really that the Lord wants to release freedom and breakthrough for those who have been struggling with anxiety, that there's healing in the house today. And then also um, those who've been just struggling with unforgiveness, where you're like, just feel like a prisoner to this unforgiveness and you want freedom, you wanna release a person, you wanna release a situation. Um, and then also for those of you, and Pastor John was talking about, man, maybe that area of your life that just feels so hard to trust God in, uh, we believe that there are strongholds that the Lord wants to break off. So if there's something that you're wrestling with, a fear, a worry, uh, come and receive prayer. There is power. Power in prayer. We are a praying people. Our team is here for you, so come on up. Um, but with that, you are released. You are dismissed. Have an incredible Sunday. We love you, church. Bless you guys.